This week on Vaticano, explore the Marian apparitions in the Eternal City, uncover the scientific evidence proving God's existence, and discover the Pope's pediatric hospital on the move in Cambodia. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. On Sunday, April the 21st, the church celebrates the 61st World Day of Vocations. In his message, Pope Francis not only thanked the priests and religious for their service, the Holy Father also highlighted the important role of the family in fostering vocations. Pope Francis urged the faithful for constant prayer for vocations, also addressing young people who feel distant about the church and encouraged them to be challenged by Jesus Christ. The Holy Father emphasized that the World Vocations Day even has a synodal character. The church is so rich in different charisms, talents, and vocations, says Francis, which is why it's so important to listen to one another. The goal of every vocation is to become men and women of hope, the Holy Father continued in his message. Everyone is called to rise up and awaken from indifference by embracing our vocation and letting Christ guide our steps. Catherine of Siena has that wonderful phrase, you know, you'd set the world on fire if we, if we do what God calls us to be. And, and that comes about when we do the project that the Lord has for us. We're not used to hearing the bad aspects of surrogacy and how it's totally unethical. Olivia Morrill herself was born via surrogacy, and now she's leading the charge to ban it. As a child born sur from surrogacy, what I mean, I've suffered from abandonment issues, identity issues, because I was abandoned by my mother at birth, and I was ripped away from her at birth. She shared her story at an international conference for the universal abolition of surrogacy at the Lumsi University in Rome. The meeting aimed to promote an international treaty to outlaw surrogacy. The conference was held near the Vatican. It comes only a few days before the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith published a document on moral questions regarding human dignity, gender, and also surrogacy. Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez presented the new document titled Dignitas Infinita, Infinite Dignity at the Vatican. In a specific paragraph, surrogacy is considered a grave violation of the dignity of the woman and the child, based on the exploitation of situations of the mother's material needs. A child is always a gift and never the basis of a commercial contract. Many couples would argue that surrogacy is the only way they can have a child. But Jennifer Lal, the founder of the Center for Bioethics and Culture Network, refutes that argument. Well, I'm very sympathetic to couples who can't have children, and they desperately want children. But I would respond by saying, but that doesn't give you the right to risk another woman's health, um, and that doesn't give you the right to buy children. <laughs> While surrogacy is banned across most countries in the European Union, the practice is permitted in the majority of U.S. states. That's a big problem when it comes to international law, according to Swedish journalist Kaisa Ekis Ekman. Well, what they need to know is surrogacy is basically violating a number of international laws and moral laws because it's about the industrial and intentional separation of mother and child. So um, unlike adoption, where you know technically there would be an orphan that would need a family, here you actually have a mother who's fit enough to carry out a pregnancy and, and who's still around, but she's not allowed to be with a child, and the child is not allowed to get to know her. Hello and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. Cardinal Angelo de Donatis is the new head of the Vatican's Apostolic Penitentiary. 
the former vicar of the Diocese of Rome, replaces Cardinal Mauro Piacenza, who has headed the dicastery since 2013. The Apostolic Penitentiary is referred to as a Tribunal of Mercy, and since this is in charge of cases involving excommunication and serious sin. After a 7.4 magnitude earthquake hit Hualien City in Taiwan, Pope Francis sent a telegram of condolences to the president of the Chinese Regional Bishops Conference of Taiwan. In it, the Holy Father assured those affected of his heartfelt solidarity and spiritual closeness. At least nine people lost their lives and more than 1,000 were injured in this disaster. Pope Francis, in a meeting with members from the Latin American, Brazilian and Mexican Pontifical Colleges, stated, Every vocation begins with a special love. He further stressed that it's the duty of all priests to keep this love alive in our world. To mark the 100 years anniversary of diplomatic relations between the Holy See and Panama, Archbishop Paul Gallagher made a four-day trip to Panama. The Vatican Secretary for Relations with States met with political authorities, celebrated Holy Mass in Panama City Cathedral, met with representatives of the Catholic community and visited a migrant reception center. The Vatican Permanent Observer to the United Nations, Gabriele Giordano Caccia, underlined that the logic of nuclear deterrence is illusionary. In a statement addressed to the UN Disarmament Commission, the Holy See described disarmament as a moral duty and called all states to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Thank you for watching this week's Vaticano Updates. Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. shrines from around the globe, from the tranquil sanctuaries in Lourdes and Fatima, to the colorful celebrations at Guadalupe in Mexico City, and on to the historical paths of Loreto, draw millions of pilgrims each year, searching for peace and healing. But there's one city that transcends them all, Rome. The Eternal City is not just the cradle of Christianity, it's the place with the largest number of Marian apparitions. Strolling through Rome, one can quickly see how much the city loves Our Lady. Almost every street corner has a picture or statue of the Madonna, known here as Madonine. Rome stands at the heart of Marian devotion, linked with the four pillars of Marian belief, the Theodokos, or Mother of God, the Immaculate Conception, Perpetual Virginity, and the Assumption. The Basilica of Santa Maria Maggiore stands as a powerful testament of the first Marian dogma, the Theodokos, declared at the Council of Ephesus, and the visual proof of one of the earliest Marian apparitions. The tradition holds that Our Lady appeared in a dream to Pope Liberius, directing him to build a church on a hill that would be miraculously covered in snow. True to her word, snow fell on the Esquiline Hill in August. Rome's hottest month. While the story of Pope Liberius and the snow-covered hill is wrapped in the mists of the fourth century, another Roman church, Sant'Andrea delle Frate, is at the heart of a more recent and well-documented Marian apparition. This event played a crucial role in inspiring Pope Blessed Pius IX to declare the dogma of the Immaculate Conception in 1854. In 1842, Our Lady appeared to Alphonse Ratisbon, who was born into a Jewish family, had turned away from all religious faith, and was a member of the Freemasons. After this apparition, Alphonse Ratisbon not only converted to the Catholic faith, but even became a priest. Father Alfonso Longobardi, the current vice parish priest at Sant'Andrea delle Frate, continues to share this extraordinary story with visitors from around the world. This apparition gives the Church a boost regarding the millennial reflection on the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. It is not coincidence that 12 years after this apparition we have the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. And immediately after the dogma of the Immaculate Conception here in the square, a few steps from the Basilica, the column of the Immaculate Conception is built. 
and D Immaculata that is placed on the column is not the classic Immaculata with open hands and open arms, but it is the Immaculata of Sant'Andrea delle Fratte. There is a finger that points the way to the church. And every year, on the 8th of December, the Pope, for this reason, comes to visit the statue. In a twist of fate, Our Lady made another appearance in Rome to someone completely unexpected, a man distant from the Catholic Church who was plotting to assassinate the Pope and was crafting a speech to denounce the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Father Joseph Roche, the Superior General of the Congregation of the Marian Fathers, a congregation deeply devoted to the mystery of the Immaculate Conception, shares this story. And there was a man uh, just after the Second World War named Bruno. He had three children. Uh, he had left the Catholic faith, become a Protestant, and uh, he was not leaving, leading a good life at any stretch. It was a Saturday right after Easter, and he brought his three children to this little park. He was going to give a talk the next day to denounce the Immaculate Conception. And he also had plans to assassinate Pope Pius XII. The miraculous event took place inside this grotto, where Our Lady revealed herself to Bruno Cornacchiola. Today, the Missionaries of Divine Revelation, a community of sisters, honor this legacy and keep the message of Our Lady alive. This place is a place of great conversion, a call to the truth of the Catholic Church. The Virgin Mary states that the true Church of her Son is based on three white loves, love of the Eucharist, love for the Immaculate Conception, and love for the Holy Father. These are the founding elements of the Catholic Church, as Bruno was outside the Catholic Church and the Virgin called him in. Our Lady gave a heavenly sign to Pope Pius XII through Bruno Cornacchiola. The Pope was asking for confirmation on how to clearly define the dogma of the Assumption in light of his encyclical issued November the 1st, 1950. Our Lady told Bruno, my body could not decay and did not decay. My son and the angels took me to heaven. And so this, uh, just as in Lourdes, there is the, uh, the link with the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. At Tre Fontani in Rome, there is a link with the dogma of the Assumption. Bruno didn't keep this divine message to himself. He brought it directly to the Vatican. In an audience with Pope Pius XII, Cornacchiola asked forgiveness for his past animosity towards the Catholic Church. A lesser known Marian manifestation took place within the serene Vatican Gardens, involving Pope Pius XII himself. The late Father Peter Gumpel, the postulator for Pope Pius XII's cause, revealed in a 2017 interview with EWTN that the Pope experienced the miracle of the sun. As he was walking in, in the garden, in the Vatican garden, he saw that suddenly the sun was touring around, describing a circle, etc., and it was going and coming, etc. And this is exactly what we know about the description that uh, happened in Fatima when uh, the so-called miracle of the sun took place in the presence of thousands of people. But whenever pilgrims come to Rome, Mary wants to uh, welcome us and uh, help us to find her son here. Ce livre, on voulait l'écrire parce qu'il n'existe pas. We wanted to write this book because it didn't exist, to provide a panorama of all the evidence of the existence of God. Science, of course, but not only science. We also wanted to include philosophy, ethics, puzzles, and even miracles, to include a little bit of everything. So, if you want, an absolute 180 degree picture. Absolument, uh, à 180 degrees. For over four centuries, the work of figures like Copernicus, Galileo, 
Darwin and Freud fostered the belief that the universe's mysteries could be unraveled without invoking a divine creator. By the early 1900s, materialism had emerged as the prevailing philosophy. However, the landscape of scientific thought experienced a dramatic shift due to a series of revolutionary discoveries, including the theory of relativity, quantum mechanics, the Big Bang, and concepts surrounding the universe's expansion, eventual heat death, and precise fine-tuning. These advancements have profoundly challenged the once solid convictions of the 20th century indicating a swing back towards perspectives that reconsider the role of metaphysical elements in the cosmos. The beginning of the world is not the work of chaos that owes its origins to something else, but it derives directly from a supreme principle that creates out of love. The Big Bang, that today is considered to be the origin of the world, does not contradict the creative intervention of God. On the contrary, it requires it. Evolution in nature is not in contrast with the notion of divine creation, because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. Once the only acceptable theory, materialism is increasingly considered an irrational belief. This book is an enquête. This book is an investigation into a single question. Can we imagine that there is nothing beyond the material universe? Or must we consider that the material universe is not sufficient unto itself and that an external cause is necessary to create and regulate it in the end? The conclusion we draw from this broad investigation is that materialism has become a belief that is truly irrational today. Following years of research and in collaboration with more than 20 scientists, Michael Yves Bolloré and Olivier Bonassis wrote God, the Science and the Proofs. The best-selling book in France aims to collect modern evidence of the existence of God. Recently, it was presented in Rome. So, Going very quickly, there are four major scientific proofs that emerged in the 20th century. What is very important is that they are completely independent of each other. That's what makes them strong. In short, four major scientific proofs independently emerged, demonstrating the universe's intricacies. From its thermodynamic trajectory suggesting a beginning and an end, hinting at a creator, to the expansion of the universe, the fine-tuning indicative of a non-random formation, and the complex emergence of life, challenging previous assumptions of its simplicity. These discoveries collectively underscore the universe's complexity and the implausibility of its attributes being mere products of chance. So these two conclusions, Le début et le réglage de l'univers. The beginning and the fine tuning of the universe that come from different sciences led to a unique and simple explanation that there is an intelligent spirit behind all this. Rationality can be applied to the discovery of God as external to the universe, as a necessary cause. We can say that the world is inconceivable without this cause, but we can't go very far in talking about God if we stick to rationality. In the world, to go further, a revelation is needed, and so we need to know if God has revealed himself. As St. Thomas said, Christ gave all the proofs needed to show that it's true. For reason, for science, for your question, there are all the elements needed to say that God exists, and even that Jesus is truly the Son of God. People think these questions can't be answered, but in fact, that's not true. Les gens pensent que ces questions, on ne peut pas y répondre. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. number of uh, children's hospital in the world, uh, certainly excellent uh, healthcare providers, 
There are fewer research pediatric hospitals, but still there are. Uh, there are none uh, that provide the best possible health care for free. Uh, in Rome, at Bambino Gesù, we accept and we treat every single child that has needs for free. And that's uh, quite a unique distinction of, uh, of the Ospedale Bambino Gesù. Founded in 1869 by Roman Duchess Arabella Salviati, the Bambin Gesù Pediatric Hospital is one of the oldest and most renowned children's hospitals in the world. In 1924, the Salviati family donated the institution to Pius XI, making it the Pope's hospital. And it is to this day under the direct governance of the Holy See. In the last decades, the hospital has become known for its high level of specialization in the treatment of children, coming not only from Italy and neighboring European countries, but from the world over. Fabrizio Arengi Bentivoglio, president of the patrons supporting the projects of the hospital, shared some insights into the hospital's international mission. We think that uh, there are opportunities to expand this beyond Italy uh, and beyond uh, European children by making the facilities available for children that don't have otherwise uh, access to superior care uh, in, uh, in, in other parts of the, of the world. Uh, there are uh, currently, as we speak, a number of initiatives to train and develop doctors, nurses, medical personnel in a number of countries around the world. And these development programs are carried out both in their own countries as well as with uh, initiatives and stages and, uh, and, and internships in Rome. One of the many countries where the pediatric hospital is active is Cambodia. With the help of Catholic missionaries, the hospital's mission has become a reality. Father Gianluca Tavola is an Italian missionary and member of the Pontifical Institute for Foreign Missions, who, together with fellow missionary Father William Conker, is, since 2007, in charge of a Cambodian parish extending over two provinces, the province of Sihunakville and the province of Koh Kong, close to the Thai border. Ecco, la Chiesa Cattolica in Cambodia è impegnata, diciamo, su due filoni molto The Catholic Church in Cambodia is committed to two very important sectors, education and health. So in each community, we have small centers of learning to bring people together, to convey to them the importance of studying, of going to school, of education. And then another very important sector is that of health, health ministry. In Cambodia, health services cost. And so the people in the villages who don't have real salaries, who cannot afford to go to the hospital, are struggling. The Catholic Church has, for this reason, developed a program, and we have been implementing it for many years, now to help the poor and sick. In addition to building churches and being in charge of schools and orphanages, the Pontifical Institute of Foreign Missions also operates or supports many local hospitals, clinics, and so-called sick shelters, both close to the large and expensive hospitals in the Cambodian capital, Phnom Penh, but also in each community where poor people often come asking for help that they cannot afford. In questi anni, si parla di vent'anni più o meno di questo progetto. In these years, we are talking about 20 years more or less of this project. We've had several collaborations, collaborations with local hospitals, and there where we bring our patients and with NGOs, Catholic and other humanitarian realities to help the sick. We have, for example, a collaboration with the Bambino Gesù Hospital in the Vatican, in Rome, with the Pope and with other realities in order to be as effective as possible in helping those in need. To give hope, this is what the Pope's hospital strives for, not just within its own walls, but reaching far beyond. Although the hospital also effortlessly works to bring sick children to Rome, the Bambino Gesù continues to strive to help the sick 
even from afar.